a battle against destiny. So before you are going through the presentation, I would like to brief you regarding the rules for the webinar so that everything runs smoothly. So let's see the guidelines for the webinar. Okay, so for the first, you, uh, first thing first, you will be muted during the presentations to prevent any interruptions occur during the webinar. Then, um, please don't unmute yourself because we don't, we avoid any disturbing sound during the webinar. So for today's presentation, as I mentioned before, it's about hornbill conservation, a battle against destiny. So there will be time after the presentation for question. So if you have any questions that comes to your mind, so don't hesitate to ask in the chat room. We will read your questions and we will try to answer it at the end of the presentation. Also, we will have an interactive Mentimeter discussion at the end of the presentation. And if you would like to have a diploma of participation, write your name and email in a private chat directly to Riza Hanselman. We will send you an email, email with your diploma after the webinar. So this uh, is the example on how you have to write through the private chat. So it is important to write through private chat so that you will not disturb the main chat and we will not miss any of your details. So please complete the survey we sent out via email after the webinar to improve our uh, current webinar and also for suggestions to uh, the future webinar. And the recorded webinar will be uploaded to our website and also YouTube channel, YRE International. So if you think that uh, you miss any points through this webinar, so don't worry, you can refer back to the YouTube channel, YRE International. So let's move on. Okay, do join our next webinar on the 6th August 2020, which uh, is Recycling and Upcycling in Hospitality. So please join our next webinar. Okay, now it's time for to introduce our presenters today, which is Mr. Ishak Mubarak, who is resident naturalist at Ida Langkawi. So I will show you a little bit about um, the speaker's profile. So Mr. Isha is one of Malaysia's most celebrated natural, naturalists with over 23 years of experience in the field. So inspired by the lives of pioneer explorers such as Alfred Russell Wallace and the re renowned botanist. So throughout his career, Isha has appeared in and contributed to many natural documentaries for Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and the BBC. You can see on the next slide, um, there's a picture of him, which is uh, involved in Discovery Channel. Okay, this one is BBC. And also he involved in a TED Talk. Yeah, okay, that's a little bit about our presenters today. So it was an honor for us to have Mr. Ishak Mubarak as our presenters for today's webinar. So, our webinar today is in partnership with the Data Langkawi. For more information, you can just go to the, their website and you can see further details about the Data Langkawi. So, that's all for the Data Langkawi. And yeah, today we have a quiz session where um, it will have a giveaway for all of you. So, do participate in our quiz at the end of the webinar to stand a chance to bring home a copy of Mr. Ishad Mubarak's book, which is Discovering Langkawi with Ishad Mubarak. So the winners will get his book. So yeah, it was an honor for us, right? Okay, so... I yes, think... Mr. Ishad, you can share your screen right now. I share yeah. my screen now? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Ishad Mubarak, the floor is yours now. Thank you so much. Okay. Here we are. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, my name is Irshad. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, so um, a little bit about my background. Um, um, my father named me Irshad. Irshad has a meaning. It means guidance or good advice. 
So I hope I will, I will live up to my father's expectations. Um, at a very young age of nine, my father put a question to me and he said, son, when you grow up, what do you want to do? And I said, dad, I want to be like that person I saw on telly. And that person I saw on telly was a gentleman called uh, David Bellamy. And I thought he was some sort of um, um, forest ranger protecting nature. And that was what I wanted to do. And so um, life will take me through many other uh, directions until finally I find what I wanted here on the island. And uh, I've come to Langkawi about 35 years, almost 36 years ago, and started bird watching. And I was introduced to the birds. And one of the birds, of the over 260 species of birds we have, here, uh, the, the hornbills are my most favorite birds. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about the pair that I know personally, so to speak, in a while. Um, but let me just go through why these birds, these birds are very charismatic birds. Um, I can't move the slide, just a second. One second, yeah. Yeah, so these are very large birds and they're very charismatic birds. And you can, if you're in a forest, you can hardly, if you see them in the forest, you, um, yeah, here they are. These are some of the examples of these birds. Look at, look at them, how large they are. They, you can't miss them. If you're walking in a forest, they are loud birds, they are large birds. And some of them, when they fly over you, you even hear them. And so I was introduced to these birds and I very quickly fell in love with them. And I hope today's uh, uh, presentation will also sort of um, uh, uh, win your hearts for some of our birds, in, especially the hornbills. In the world, we recognize 57 species of hornbills. Now, this, the hornbills, as you can see, are sub-Saharan Africa, right down to South Africa, then into a little bit of uh, Southwest Saudi Arabia and Southwest uh, Yemen. And then there's nothing else, there's no hornbills until you reach uh, the Indian subcontinent. And from the subcontinent right down to Southeast Asia, including parts of Southern uh, China right through the penins Indochina, Peninsula, Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua, and the Philippines. So hornbills first evolved out of Africa. And from Africa, they radiated to the rest of the world. And when they were in Africa, when they were first uh, in the early um, evolution of hornbills, they were carnivorous birds. In time, later in time, when they come to Asia, they will eventually, uh, um, their diet will change and they become omnivorous birds. And then some of them will recolonize bits of Africa. And now most hornbills uh, around the world are omnivorous uh, birds. Yeah, they eat a lot of fruits and a lot of insects, lizards, etc. Uh, small animals even caterpillars and so forth even. Uh, uh, some of the larger hornbills will eat squirrels and chicks of other birds as well. So in the world, 57 species. Genetics are changing these numbers. Genetic science will change it. Now some suggest it's over 60, 60 plus uh, hornbills, but I'll keep to some of the old science for the, for the time being. Now, the largest hornbill in the world is found, is the southern ground hornbill. It is found in South Africa. And it's also the heaviest hornbill we have. It weighs almost 5.5 kilos. The second largest hornbill, but the largest hornbill in Asia, is the great hornbill from the from the tip of its bill to the tip of its tail, uh, this hornbill is measured at 
uh, 1.3 meters. And it can weigh up to 3.3 kilos, in fact. So this, there's some uh, changes in the uh, kilos as we get more information. In Asia, 32 species. Of the 32, the great hornbill is also, is our largest in Asia, and it's the second largest hornbill on the planet. I'm not talking length, huh? but I'm talking by weight. Here's the longest. In Southeast Asia, there are 27 species. Uh, genetics are changing that numbers, of course. And the, the longest of all the hornbills is the helmeted hornbill. It is, uh, if you count in that extra bit of tail you see uh, at the back there, the length of the tail, that's an additional 50 centimeters. So it's about 1.2 meters plus the tail, another 50 centimeters. It's measured at 1.7 meters. And it's a, a hornbill whose cask, the, the cask is that helmety at the top there, uh, is, is solid and not, uh, it's not, um, it's, it's solid, really solid. So here's the, the, the problem with the helmeted hornbill is that this solid cask is highly sought after uh, in the East. Uh, by the Japanese and even by Chinese, in which has put this hornbill under a lot, a lot of stress. They are killed for their cusk. And then uh, they send them to usually Vietnam and some of the other countries where people then carve figurines on it and as well as uh, faces and so forth on it. And it is then sold to uh, and highly valued in Japan and some parts of China as well. Yeah, it's, it's considered to be the golden ivory. So unfortunately, this has put the helmeted hornbill at the very edge of extinction here in Southeast Asia. In Malaysia, we have 10 species of hornbills. And when you ask people about hornbills in Malaysia, you ask the, the common man uh, uh, on the street, and it first come to mind is Sarawak. And that's because they call Sarawak the land of the hornbills. Now, Sarawak is in the big island of Borneo. Uh, in Borneo, they have eight species of hornbills. On the peninsula, we have all what Borneo has, plus two more. So, if you want to be technical, peninsula Malaysia is the land of the hornbills. There are 10 species of hornbills, confined particularly, all 10 can be found in the state of Perak and, uh, and Kedah. In fact, that's the highest concentration of diversity, uh, species diversity in the world for, for area. I mean, Thailand has 13 species of hornbills, but in an area uh, the size of Ulumuda or the size of Royal Balom, the Mongol, uh, we all have 10. And so no other place on the planet can compare for the number of hornbill species for size. So you could say uh, uh, Perak, Northern Perak and Northern Kedah are, is in fact the hornbill capital of the world. We're very lucky. Here on the island of Langkawi, we have just three species. And the great hornbill was the first one I, I ever got a chance to see. Uh, it's, uh, it's, an, uh, it's an amazing bird. The one right at the bottom there, the three hornbills you see, uh, the one uh, with the extra large cusk, black and white, and the red eye, you notice that? That's a, a male from the tip of the bill to the tip of its tail. It's measured at one meter 30. The males are larger than females. Females could measure at one meter 10. And then on the top left side of my screen is this bizarre looking one. It's called the wreath hornbill. Now, when these two hornbills fly over you, you hear them. They make a rather loud whoosh 
sound. So I'll try to mimic that. I hope you can see me. I uh, hear that. So it, when you fly over you, it goes. And uh, for the great hornby, when, you, when it calls, you'll never forget the call. It's a rather loud pop, pop, pop. And when I first heard this bird, I didn't know where the sound was coming from. I was hiking with my mentor and we were walking close to the forest and when we heard this, it's really loud. And I looked at him and he looked at me. And I said, oh, that looks like a big beast somewhere. Let's, let's get out of the jungle. And we left up. But in time, we will learn which, who, that it's just a bird, a massive bird. Yeah, the great hornbill. And so the wreath hornbill and the oriental pipe are much smaller. So here are some interesting features of um, hornbills. So I'll just show you the anatomy and, the, and some of the uh, wonderful features. So this is the cusk, that extra bit on the top. Cask is a French word for, or Latin word for helmet. For, with the exception of the helmeted hornbill, the cask is, uh, is, is actually full of um, cavities and rods. So it's strong, like a sandwich structure, strong but very light. And these are birds, they need to fly, so they have to have such, uh, they couldn't be too heavy. And you notice the bill of this bird is, a, is uh, uh, almost uh, is more than a foot long for the great hornbill. And if it was heavy, they won't be able to fly easily. Yeah? There's more, another look at the cusk from, uh, see how beautiful it is, so interesting uh, forms. Uh, in, and the bones are also, birds' bones are quite similar because they have to be lightweight. So they, they have evolved bones to give to, uh, that's full of cavities like this to make them lighter when they fly. And look at the eyes. This is the eyes of hornbills. And uh, this is, of course, the ground hornbill, but it's the same for other hornbills. Look, they have eyelashes. It's actually a modified feather around the eye. Why do they need that? You see, uh, these birds, uh, fruit-eating birds, will have to go through the leaves and the little, little twigs and branches to reach out for the food. There's a lot of dirt and dentritis and uh, organic material falling down, so the eyelashes protect their eyes from, uh, from dirt entering the eyes. It also helps shade the eyes from direct rays of the sun. And if you look at the eyes, look, they are looking at you straight in the face because these eyes, unlike many other birds, you'll notice they have eyes on the sides of their heads. But hornbills have their eyes to the front and there's a reason for that. Yeah, this allows that this, uh, they have such a long bill. Having eyes face forward allows them to see the, their tip of the bill. So chickens have the same, they have binocular visions, yeah, but many other birds um, uh, do not have it. So hornbills, chicken, few birds have such binocular vision, uh, so it allows them to see the tip of their bill. This allows them to be able to reach out for the fruit on the tree and, uh, and ever so um, delicately break the fruit off and consume. And they have a gland uh, for the great, uh, the gland is usually on the back at the base of the tail. So this is called the preening gland. <coughs> the preening gland secretes a, a, an oil and this oil, which is a little yellow actually for the great hornbill, uh, allows it to waterproof its feathers. And also, in fact, the, if you see the color around the neck, the feathers around the neck of the hornbill. Uh, that is also, uh, is the oil from the preening gland. They turn, they rub their neck and their head onto the preening gland and gives them that color. So the male's hornbill also actually uses, you could say makeup, to look pretty for the females. And the females who have makeup. Now, if you look at hornbills, I'm just gonna go back again. If you look at um, hornbills, the most colorful part of the hornbill 
is actually the region from the neck Uh, Mr. Richard? I think there's technical problem. Okay, while well, we're waiting, maybe uh, for the audience, yes, you can actually ask questions in the chat box below on the side. So, uh, in, uh, whenever Mr. Richard is back, we can direct those questions at the end of the uh, webinar session. Okay, technical difficulty, never mind that. So, uh, as you know, we have a lot of species for the hornbill, and each one of them has their own specific and unique criteria. So, uh, I guess, have you is seen it, one it, of those? Is it coming back? Uh, uh, yeah, oh, Mr. Shah is back. But, Great. <laughs> yeah. All right. I thought of calling Shakira to do the presentation, so... Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mr. Ishai, can you... Yeah. <clears throat> now you have to unmute yourself, Mr. Ishai. Okay. All right. Cool. Yes, you just discovered I come from a different generation. <laughs> uh, when we did uh, uh, letters during my time, we hit the drums and make smoke signals. That's how we sent our messages across. All right. So, uh, just in case people miss this, you notice that when it comes to hornbills, the most colorful part of a hornbill. is the region between the neck and right to the tip of the bill. The rest of the body for most hornbills, nearly all of hornbills, is plain black and white. To differentiate the male from the female, for example, let's take the great hornbill on the top right hand side. The male has black orbital skin. Orbital skin is the skin, is the, uh, the skin around the eyes and the male has a red eye. The female, if you notice, has a red orbital skin and a white eye. That's how you differentiate the male from the female. And for most hornbills, that's where the differentiation comes in. Of course, you can use size. As a general rule, the males of the great hornbills tend to be a little larger than the females. But that's not the best way of uh, telling them apart. Yeah? The best way, of course, is to find those subtle differences in the coloration of, of the eyes and other parts of the body. For example, the wreath hornbill, the one below the great hornbill there, the females have a blue gula pouch. Gula pouch is where the throat, just under the base of the bill, you see that's blue. That's a female wreath hornbill and the male is next to her. She has a yellow uh, gula pouch. I love the one at the bottom. He's pretty funky, looks like um, a bit of um, a punk. Yeah. I guess you're too young to know what punks were. Oops, uh, how do I move this again? Okay. Let's move to the next one. Yes. Now, the Malays have a saying Kalau tak kenal, maka tak cinta. So I want to bring you into my world and I want to talk about a real actual event. It's based on actual event. And some of the, some of the images you see here on your screen are actual images of that pair. Of course, I had to add here and there a couple of other things. But this is a love story. And I know this pair very well. This is the pair that lives at the Datai area. 
So what you have here is the female great hornbill that lives by the Datai forest. She's from the tip of her bill to the tip of her tail. She's measured at one meter 20, one meter 15. And this is a male hornbill, as you can see, that he's a little larger. Now, these birds, uh, about 27 years ago, I took a film crew up to, Nash, up to Gunung Raya. It was the early part of the year, it was first week of January. It's the season of love and courtship on the island. And here's the courtship of the great hornbill. They, re they reach maturity at year five. And so we came to a group, a flock of, of a total of um, 20, 25 great hornbills. It's a bachelor, bachelorette group. It's the season of love and courtship on the island. And so these young males are fighting uh, to, to, to gain the favors of a female, to win a female over. So there's a lot of sword play with the bills. These males are clashing. They, you almost hear a clapping sound. They are fighting in the air sometimes, jousting in the, like knights with lances. In mid-air, they are jousting yeah, and showing off to the females. And then three males we will capture on film for the first time. Males, uh, three, three males are passing the females fruit, pushing and pu pushing for the opportunity to fighting, pushing for the opportunity to be the only one to offer fruit. Yeah, she knows how to find her own fruit. But when it comes to courtship season, uh, the, she will allow uh, the, these young males to feed her. Eventually, she will make a decision. Yeah? And when she makes her decision, she will then um, uh, uh, pair off for life. Hornbills are monogamous. They pair off for life. And her nest, uh, very soon after, when it comes to the nesting season, it was courtship season's over, and on the island, nesting season is end of January uh, and early week in February. The female will look for a cavity in a tree. She enters the cavity. If she likes it, she now begins to plaster herself inside. She begins to uh, plaster herself using the pulp of regurgitated fruit. And it makes a wonderful, and of course, drop uh, 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 some fecal matter. This fecal matter and um, regurgitated fruit makes a wonderful plaster. And that cavity there will slowly be closed. Okay. It seems that we have technical problem again. Yeah, we lost his connection again. Um, Shakira, Shakira is actually that type stuff. So, ah, I see. Maybe you can share something with us. While Irshad is coming back. And before that, probably announcement for those who have recently joined. You may uh, privately message uh, Reza to claim your participation certificate. Uh, Shakira? Hi. <laughs> Do you want to say something while uh, we are looking uh, if to join? Yeah, sure. Maybe I can uh, answer some of the questions. Uh, yes, please. Um, so I see here that there's questions about what does hornbill eat? 
uh, they eat mainly fruits, but they do also go after for smaller uh, animals, like Mr. Arisha said earlier, um, lizards, smaller snakes, maybe even some squirrels. Hi. Uh, and then uh, the Hornbill Festival. It is, um, it was named after the Indian Hornbill, which is also the same as the Great Hornbill. And whether they fly in flocks or alone, it's also uh, depending. Um, when they are juveniles, they do tend to hang out in uh, bigger flocks. But um, once they have mated, they will always be together. Okay. Yeah, is there any other questions that I'm missing maybe? Yeah, maybe for what is the function of a hornbill's casque? Is it the uh, so of the hornbill? Yeah, it's actually interesting. It's sort of like their amplifier. It, it actually helps, um, how do you say, make their sound louder as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so sort of when they call, it sort of resonates inside and it becomes louder. For the so it is safe to assume that the function is similar to microphone. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, you can say that. Uh, uh, for for how is the hornbills protected in Malaysia? We'll wait for Mr. Irshad because I think he has a slide on that. Um, are hornbills aggressive? No, they are almost like gentle giants. Can Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. Now let me get that. Uh... Thank you, Shakira, for sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Shakira. Most welcome. Yeah. Can Can you all allow me to share the screen? Yes. Uh, of course, this is. Uh, yes. Now we're okay. Okay. Now, okay. Share screen again. Okay. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. Not in full screen. Oh, not in full screen. Okay, okay so you can just go for this. Single picture. Okay. Is that better? Got me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, wait, uh, sorry for the connection here. It's pretty, it's pretty difficult. I'm in the middle of a wonderful jungle. Okay, so um, I, I, I go off where I left off, right? I continue. So the female will plaster. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Richard. Carry on. Okay, so yeah, so female will plaster herself in the cavity. She remains in this cavity for a total of 11 and a half weeks. Throughout the time she's in there, as you can see in this uh, uh, slide, the male flies off and returns every half an hour to one hour, maybe sometimes up to two or three hour intervals, depending how far he has to travel. He comes back with room service uh, to feed her. And uh, about 70% of the diet is made up of fruit. And 30% is made up about, of little animals like lizards, snakes, millipedes, centipedes, uh, eggs of other birds, the chicks of other birds. And uh, he even brought her, this male is the one that I have here, uh, he even brought her a squirrel. Whatever she orders for breakfast, right? <laughs> uh, scrambled eggs, perhaps. Yep. Anyway, uh, this is what um, he feeds us religiously, continuously, for about three months, without fail, he will feed her. She's not having a holiday. Uh, um, while he's busy feeding her, she remains in the nest to care and protect her one baby. For the great hornbill, it is usually just one chick. If there happens to be a second chick, 
it's likely that chick will not make it. So she will only care for one chick. And that chick is, uh, will grow very quickly in a short period of time. And when it's time for then, uh, not too long later, for the, male, for the female to break up, then both parents will then feed their young. Uh, and another three to four weeks before uh, the young bird will break itself out, encouraged by its parents, it will then um, break out of the nest and then join its parents uh, on feeding ones to discover uh, the parents will teach it what are the fruit trees and so forth in the vicinity. And then also in this process, they will be introduced, the chick, because it's a common fruiting tree and we get uh, all the bachelors and the bachelorettes and other pairs of hornbills coming, uh, they would the chick would be introduced to the bachelor, the bachelorette flock the sub-adults flock. And then when it's time uh, for the young bird uh, to, to, before the new nesting season is about to start again, about maybe two months before the new nesting season, uh, to start again, the young bird will then be, in, will in, be encouraged by the, uh, its parents to join the bachelor and the bachelorette flock. Yeah, and the bachelor, bachelorette flock here goes up to about 26 to, We've counted even up to 50 over birds. And we hold the record, the national record here on Mankawi for the one time sitting of maybe a total of two or three flocks, bachelor juvenile flocks coming together and feeding on three fig trees that were in fig in Pantai Kok area. And we counted up to 114 birds. And that's some uh, six, seven years ago. 114 great hornbills, massive, beautiful birds. Yeah? Now, this is a, a, nine, a 2015 baby of the pair that was here. It's a baby boy, as you can see, in the top right-hand corner. And this year, I think it's another baby boy. I have not seen the baby this year, uh, but I, I, I hope uh, to see it soon. It could be a boy or a girl. I've not had a chance to witness this year's uh, chick fledgling. Yeah. So hornbills, uh, in short, are um, uh, rather large birds. They require a, 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 a lot of space, a large tracts of land because uh, they, uh, to feed. They, need, they feed between all the tree species, about 200 species of rainforest trees. So they need to travel wide distances to get to their rainforest trees. So they need a wide open space, uh, wide areas of jungle. They need these areas also not just for food, but for shelter and nesting, and for them to sustain pop the large uh, 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 areas to have men, uh, the population to be more, and this way they can sustain a healthy gene pool. But we have a problem here on the island. We are losing, so to speak, paradise. I'm going to show you some very disturbing images. Perhaps this is what Lankawi looked like about a thousand years ago, or maybe uh, two thousand years ago, when it was a uh, was a was an Eden, so to speak. And then perhaps about nine eight hundred years ago, the first man came to the island. He was mostly a fishing community, fishing and villages started. And then they expanded into agriculture and started removing the forests, encroaching into the forest. It's understandable. People must feed their families as well. You have to consider that. And then more still in more recent times. And this image is a 2002 image. And you can see that Lankawi has lost about... 50% of its natural heritage. And great hornbills, except, and wreath hornbills need forests. So as their habitat is highly threatened. And in addition to that, um, we, um, the, the other reasons for uh, the uh, loss of biodiversity on the island is the introduction of invasive species, its pollution, its population increase, 
and over harvesting yeah, of, uh, of forests and so forth and things like that. That's the main reason of, for the loss of biodiversity on Langkawi. Remember the term HIPPO, H-I-P-P-O, it's in short, habitat destruction, invasive species, pollution, population, and over harvesting. This is an acronym for the reasons for the loss of biodiversity that you normally, uh, especially on islands, and even applies to the mainland. So these are recent, recent images of encroachment, further encroachment uh, of, um, into forest reserves. And even the one below there, that's a mangrove habitat that's been totally decimated. They decimated about 10 hectares of mangroves just outside the, the uh, geopark. And you know what that was for? That was to create a nature park. It's kind of ironic to destroy nature, to create a nature park. So these are some of the issues we're facing. Here are invasive species, dogs and cats. I mean, it's, it's okay to have cats and if you've got pets, but people should feed them. Because when they don't, when they get hungry, they go out and if they can't get enough food, they go out and hunt wildlife. They hunt the mouse deers. They hunt the ground nesting birds. Um, they, 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 they kill monkeys and so forth. Yeah, so invasive species, we should spay the cats, care and feed them and the other animals. Of course, pollution, the whole waters around Mankawi is slowly, gradually uh, being polluted by plastics, especially. And of course, when I say population, that means it's unregulated uh, tourism, where people go into natural areas without best practices. This puts and destroys, for example, the mangroves, uh, the speed of the boat, then erodes the bank, and the trees fall over, mangroves, uh, uh, reduced and the okay, Shakira, so I think you are up again. <laughs> Hi, sorry, the connection must be really unstable. Um, but Okay, let's go back to the questions. Let me see. Uh, so I think my colleague is also answering some of the questions via messenger, but do they protect their eggs and babies like other birds? Uh, in a way, yes but I think having their nest inside a cavity of a tree is a really unique way to them as well. Um, and then, uh, like Mr. Rishad says, she will actually stay in with the baby and protect it from any predators, for example, maybe a macaque or something that is climbing the tree. Um, yeah, then baby will be left alone inside after a few weeks, a female will come out and baby will be left alone because uh, the food demand from baby and mom is too high. So mom and dad has to feed the baby. Yeah? Let me see what else. Yeah, so the next question is, are uh, on bill aggressive? No, no, they are no. They generally no, but um, if, if uh, they are fed, for example, if the oriental pied hornbills are fed too much by humans, of course, we should never feed wildlife, but if oriental pied hornbills do get fed a lot, they tend to harass people. So in certain mm -hmm. parts of the country, you can actually see that happening where uh, you can go to areas and feed hornbills and then they are aggressively, not to hurt you, but they harass you. Okay. So yeah. they don't uh, attack. So do they attack people? I think we have answered the question. Uh, how long the female on bill inside the cavity? Uh, four to five weeks. Okay. All right. So now Ishad is back. Yay! <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Just, I'm just trying to get to back to the slides again. Mm. Here we are. Okay, can you see that? Right, yeah, so with the loss of forests, uh, uh, 
with less forest on the island, we are now seeing, um, because the runoff is greater, we are, we are suffering, uh, and for the first time seeing, in the last 10 years alone, 10 to 15 years, we're seeing flash floods. And during El Nino years, the, the tree, the normal tree month dry season, feels like an El Nino year every year now, uh, where some rivers run dry, some agriculture is also uh, burnt out, like in, uh, you'll see in some slide, uh, some areas where rubber, rub, uh, not rubber tree, sorry, um, rambutan trees burn out because their roots cannot reach water. There's also, uh, we suffer also uh, uh, when the haze season starts, although we don't get as much haze as on the peninsula uh, and other parts in Borneo, etc. but we do get the haze. The forest actually helps uh, reduce the effects of the haze. And of course, our waters, our rivers and all that from development uh, and from unregulated uh, tourism, boats are speeding up and down with tourists. Uh, it is, there's more erosion in the banks and the waters are getting uh, more sedimentation that then leads out to the sea, smothering the corals, etc. So this too is a result of, um, of unregulated, uh, it's un not a very well planned uh, uh, thing for our, our island. Next slide. Can you see the saving paradise? Can you see that? All right. So what, what then can we do to save? So we are, we are doing our thing now. We're trying to, to reverse this uh, in saving paradise. We need to identify core ecological um, zones all the remaining habitats need to be protected. We need to create buffer zones around the core ecological zones and to create wildlife corridors. Yeah. And what are, so this, what are wildlife corridors? Is to identify close points where different core ecological zones meet and try to reforest these areas by creating wildlife corridors. Here again, some, here's another image of what it looks like. So as you can see, there are two core ecological zones, the buffer zone, and the part in orange is, let's say, uh, 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 villages and agricultural zones. We need to reestablish the connection. Why we need that? Because animals need a healthy gene pool. Uh, even uh, civet cats, monkeys, they need to travel between zones so they can keep can uh, meet healthier gene pools. They can migrate to search for food and so forth, yeah? So here are some examples of, uh, of uh, wildlife corridors uh, around the world, even for, for fish, uh, for some in Australia as well. What, this is what is needed when we plan, uh, when we do town planning and city uh, and so forth. That's what they need to, in, to think about nature, to think about the animals, to think about biodiversity and allowing these uh, uh, creatures to migrate between core ecological zones. Yes, yeah, hotels are now employing in-house naturalists as nature guides to create awareness. Uh, we, we should do tree, planting trees to attract birds and butterflies and additional um, uh, beneficial wildlife on their own property control invasive species. And this is what the Datai Pledge Wildlife for the Future is all about. Uh, there's, uh, ours is Wildlife for the Future, and we're trying to do exactly that where possible. We, we are trying to reconnect, we are trying to reforest, and we're also doing research work with Shakira over there, uh, and Razano uh, also, uh, actively participating. Yeah, I okay, think. Sakira. Okay, Sakira, I'm can back we, on. Uh, I think uh, we will play the slides. I mean, we will okay. uh, this one slide. So I think um, then you can proceed to uh, the next slide while Ifshad sure. is coming. Yeah. Sure. Please okay. share the slides, please. Uh, second. Oh, yeah, Amy, yeah. maybe you can answer some of the questions first. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. All right. Yeah. Uh, do they protect their eggs and babies like other birds? I think the answer is yes. Uh, 
Yes, they do. Uh, they, they protect their babies and they once they're out, even when the baby is out of the cavity, they do feed the baby and show it around like other birds do. Okay. How long is the lifespan of the hornbills? So it varies, but for the great hornbill, it's 25 years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where does the male hornbill sleep? So I really like that question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I really like that question. I was looking at it earlier. I, they just roost on tree branches and you can actually go to a part of Langkawi called Gunung Raya and you can see all the males roosting in a nearby area. Hi, mm. he's back. Yeah, and uh, I think there's, there's a subsequent question from this French, Francis Lok. How many babies will hornbills have over their lifetime? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it also depends, but they can have only one chick a year. Yeah, all right. If yeah, they are so living for 25 years, I think, I don't know, not 25, isn't it? No, not 25, maybe, maybe, definitely not. Let me answer the great hornbill. Thank that you. Yeah, thank you, Shakira. Uh, yeah, the great hornbill can live between 30 to 35 years. Uh, at least the one that's here, I know how old it is. Um, the female at least, the male I don't know because there's a sad story to that. But um, the great hornbill matures at year five. Okay. Yeah. Oh la la. Yeah, he's still there. Okay. Boring. Ah, back again. <laughs> Voila. Where do I go now? Can you all hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. So you can see the screen as well. Yes. <clears throat> we lost him again. Um, yeah. I guess I'll be just sharing the other slides from my point. Yeah, I think, uh, all right, so you share your slides. Okay. Mm. It's going to be... Uh, sorry for the technical errors. Yeah, oh, what was it? Yeah, Shakira, uh, there is a question about what are the benefit or the contribution of hornbills to us ecologically? Like, what are the, you know, purposes? Uh, maybe you can um, answer that first. Yeah, so uh, we, we like to refer to them as the farmers of the rainforest. Their seed dispersal is very, very important for our rainforest. Um, All right. And uh, are hornbills uh, migratory birds? There are some species that do migrate, but species like the great hornbill do not go anywhere, no. Okay. So um, for Langkawi, the reed hornbill comes to us from Thailand. Ah, all right. Yeah. So is there any harmful effects to the nest of hornbill by any other organisms? Um, so I think rot, uh, yeah, rot or, or also uh, the, so because it's a cavity in a tree, a lot of different animals like to use that as well as nests. Mm -hmm. um, and also, hornbills are very particular about the kind of nest that they need. So the female is very, very particular about it. It needs to be a certain height from the ground. It needs to be a certain width on the inside. It needs to um, be on a live tree because it's more cooling. I think Mr. Irshad is back. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, can, you, uh, can I like to share the screen again? Very quickly, I'll... Yes. Okay. You can share it now. Okay. Right. Okay, yeah. So, um, I'll answer the questions later. We got a really bad connection. I don't know why it's the first time it's happening. Yeah, so part of wildlife for the future is to reconnect by creating wildlife corridors over core ecological zones. We have set up a nursery 
uh, wild tree nursery, native tree nursery, which are now uh, collecting seeds every year, putting it into the ground, uh, uh, and when they're large enough, these saplings uh, you, are used for reforestation work. And of course, we're doing research. Uh, we hope to find our most elusive animal. We hope, we heard, there is a clouded leopard on the island. Hope, if there is, then all our conservation efforts should be based on this apex predator. Uh, next, that's, this is what we're doing. We're putting road signages and we're teaching the public education when they come into the Datai area. We ask them to slow down, be cautious. We also tell them such a thing as river corridors, etc., and to drive slowly to avoid road kills. Here's some of the wild seeds we collected this year. We've got a little space within the hotel property to, uh, to propagate. And when they're large enough, uh, we will then um, uh, use these particular seeds for our reforestation, these plants. We've also done nesting boxes for owls. We're experimenting, not so successful yet, with our um, uh, swallow artificial nesting boxes to get them away from public, uh, uh, high traffic, human traffic, because they poop, right? We've got camera traps around the resort to try to capture all these other animals. And of course, we've installed uh, an experimental artificial hornbill nest on one of the Maranti trees. And uh, we'll see, we're getting expert uh, advice from our NGO partner, is uh, Gaia. And I hope that uh, they too will one day give us a talk like this. We've done work in 2007 getting kids collecting seeds, and then the seeds are given to a local nursery man who then cares for it when it's, when it's large enough, we then reforest. Here's an example of before and after. Yeah, it was Earth Day, and we got all the local communities and local uh, uh, authorities to give us permission, and we created a day where we did reforestation work. And look at it, it's now a big forest there. And birds have all come back as well. Why does Langkawi matter? You ask me, why would Langkawi matter? Because what is happening here is happening across our country. We are losing habitat, we're losing natural forests on the peninsula in Borneo as well. Because we, what is happening to Langkawi is happening, we are a microcosm of what is happening all across Malaysia, all across the planet. And that's why, although what we do may be small, we hope that other people would replicate it, other, other um, stakeholders will replicate it so we can then uh, fight the good fight. At least win battles, we wanna win the battle here and hopefully it'll be a good example for others as well. And that's the end of my interrupted um, presentation. I'll take the questions. Any questions? Where do I find the questions now? Mm. Okay, so we're going to move the Metimeter. In the meantime, uh, you can log in to Metimeter. I will share the link. So uh, participants could use the code, the Mentimeter code, to ask any questions that you want to ask, so that Mr. Ishad can answer your questions. Okay. Okay, okay I right. think there is one interesting question here from Francis Locke. Are you aware of any folk tales of traditional stories that feature the on bill? Thinking of Sun Kanchil for mouse beer. Oh, um, nothing comes to mind to me, but I know in Sarawak, the hornbill is associated with uh, their, their warrior culture. It's sort of considered to be like the, 
uh, I wouldn't say God, but like the spirit of war. And so they have special dances uh, to honor the hornbill called, uh, you know, they have a dance in, in uh, Sarawak that mimics the flight of the hornbill. So I know in that culture they have, they use the hornbill as, uh, as a, a dance, as a, a revered animal. They, they also were using originally, they would use uh, real feathers of the hornbill, and that means you have to sometimes uh, perhaps kill a bird, but now they're using alternative uh, replicas. So this is uh, moving towards a more sustainable way of, of enjoying the animal. Okay. Uh, how do you measure the yeah. body of the hornbill? Yeah, birds are measured from the tip of the bill to the tip of the tail. That's how you measure birds. Um, oh, there, that's Shakira has done that already. Major threat to hornbills? Major threat is these birds need large rainforest trees because they need large cavities. That means they need large trees to nest in. And large means intact forests. And as we continue to lose rainforest, hornbills will have less places to nest. So the biggest threat to hornbills, number one, is loss of habitat. Number two is persecution. People are shooting some of them to, for their cask, as in case of the helmeted hornbill. Uh, here on the island, they were shooting hornbills to eat them. Uh, and so it's illegal. They are protected animals. You just can't. So it's, it's, you have to be always uh, vigilant. On the mainland too, they hunt them uh, to eat them as well. And then there is also, I know sometimes hornbills are, uh, are used in, uh, in Phuket as, uh, as a curiosity. They have them displayed at uh, establishments so people, will, tourists will stop and look what kind of bird is this and this is where it's like, a, like a, to fish customers, right? Okay, any other questions? Um, yeah, I think uh, most of the questions we have answered while we are having um, uh, technical, the technical, technical, technical issues. Yeah. yeah, well done, Shakira. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, I think there is uh, no further question. Uh, so I think we're going to do some uh, uh, code quiz. So that is the hand of the webinar. Yes, Cheryl, please. Yes. Yeah, please join kahoot.it. I'm going to uh, play the game and the lucky three will be able to bring home a copy of Mr. Richard Mabara award-winning, you can say, a life gu guide of Langkawi wildlife and rainforest. Oh, okay. Yeah, who's going to ask the question? You guys, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, we will use Kahoot for the game. Shaira, can you share the screen? I am sharing the screen. Maybe there. Can you see the screen? No. No. Oh. We okay, let me uh, you can end first and then you start. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. Okay, how about now? Okay, cool. Yeah, Mr. Isha, in the meantime, yes, uh, maybe you can talk about your background your history because I was uh made aware that you are you used to be a banker, like what right. is uh, yeah. Right, um, I come from a science background, I studied science, uh, but I also did a lot of sports. And uh, in, the in, 19, uh, in the late 70s, um, I did rugby and I did athletics. I was trained by my, my dear brother, who was a national athlete, his name was Istiak Mubarak. Uh, and, uh, I was a bit of a sportsman, a little bit. And at that time, banks were hiring people. So as soon as I finished my education, uh, the banks uh, caught us and they thought there was some bucket in sports. So I've entered the banking field. 
and I was doing rugby and sports for the bank. And really, that was why I went to the bank. But it wasn't, you know, but I found that I was got caught in traffic jams and all that kind of stuff in KL. I didn't really enjoy it. And I made a trip while still working the fourth year of bank, of four and a half years of banking. I made a, a trip to Tioman Island and I went snorkeling for the first time in my life. And when I was underwater, I was just blown away by the colors I saw and all, and all the memories of enjoying nature as a young kid, going into the forest of Tasibara, uh, uh, enjoying it all came back to me. And I knew on the plane uh, coming back from Tioman that that's it, I cannot be a banker. I cannot be sitting in a, in a bus in a city for an hour and 15 minutes to get to a workplace and not enjoying the work I was doing. And so I made, it, uh, my, I made a decision to leave the bank after four and a half years. I traveled around, I worked here and there. I always wanted to be by the beach. And some 36 years ago, I came to Langkawi and decided this would be home. And uh, I started um, learning how okay, to bird watch. Start the question as you yeah. go along. Yeah, so I, I became a bird watcher first. Okay, so first question goes to Hero, whoever that is. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the second question. How many species of hornbills are there in Malaysia? Okay. So Hero is the leading well, the you, team. Okay. That okay. doesn't mean he gets two books of the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the high concentration of Hondi species diversity in Malaysia is Bulu Muda Kena. Is it true or not? happened though Okay, so we have our three lucky winners, Hero, Ina, and Maria. Please do uh, leave your details to either me, Ma, Barkis, or Mrs. Sri. Uh, yeah. Okay. You can private chat us. Yeah. To give the details. And we will email a fresh copy of signed book by Mr. Richard to you directly to your house. So, no yeah. worries. Yeah, and also Francis Locke. I think you have to leave your details as well because you asked most of the good questions. 
So we yeah. want to give you some Agreed. award as well. All right. So Francis Locke. So please leave your details. All right. There is a last question here uh, from Paritosh Hamid from India. Why does one bills mimic sounds of other species? In India, there is an Indian grey on bill which mimics black kite. Oh, you know, um, I don't have an answer for that, but this is interesting information to me. So I know uh, some birds uh, here do mimic, uh, for example, the the racket tail drongo can mimic the call of uh, one certain uh, mimic the call of a of a, a macaque monkey. Uh, it can it has a, a very wide repertoire of uh, songs. It can identify its enemy by name by having a different call for a different enemy. Perhaps perhaps th um, that's what the hornbill is doing. It's trying to perhaps scare away a certain. Uh, Competition, competition, so you can get uh, to a food source. For example, maybe I'm just guessing. I, I can't say for sure, but perhaps there's a fruiting tree that squirrels and hornbills are fighting for, and by mimicking this call, it may scare the squirrels away, and so the hornbill has better chance at uh, taking more food, perhaps uh, less competition, perhaps. But uh, this is news to me, and uh, I would love to to uh, read up about that as well. If if you have any uh, scientific papers on that, I would love to go through that as well. Thank yeah. you. All right. So I think uh, that is the uh, end of the session. So yes, Balkis. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ishai, for spending your time with us. Although there is a lot of technical problems but you still managed to complete your presentation and also thank you, thank you for Shakira, Shakira yeah. for helping thank us. You Shakira. Yeah. Back up team. Help. Yeah. Yeah, back up team. So thank you so much and thank you to everyone who joined us. So um hope to see you for the next webinar. Thank you so much and see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks Ari. Bye. Thanks, Mr. Chair. End the webinar yeah. now. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, Balkis. Yeah, thank you.